Amir Foni, Darajoli, in Metican and what Tin E. One Low TV and Cloniani Emma acquired. Tin E. Upwa, Menge King A. A Tikila Tin Wa, Megua, Mapola Dan Ponge, and to twelve and to ten American were bock locked. I kept my G. I wadi Uni, Yup any, or better you come out Kilu, E. A. Lo Tin Wa, or Megua, Megua, Maguti, Matak, Maguti, Kidiro. But when you keep story, or when you keep quaggy, or when you get a little more money experience, gay. So, Tin Kiyum each my dear dog, my dear, a tea key will not make you want any Tony or cow or toa. America Kwan, you will come profile Patoni. Tony T, executive director, may stand big business incubator, and over be the national content manager, a total. Tia Ben La Poklor and a little more money journalist. And when I tell a Biacha, I'm a tech to all businessman. Tier Latin Mokwan, my dear to one key, Lobomawa or key UK, La Biacha, I'm a tech. And to Tian, I believe in a conga tea conky lab. Moral, lab, 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 low up a tech to all. And I may be a one one took my mayo gunner, Ben or Quan, or Lemon or Ben a bear. So Tian, I live in a call, ye con, a lock, lab more. Tony, welcome to One Road TV. No boy. Bad it was. Yeah, it's in the name. It's a bad. It's a bad. It's a bad. Okay. I enter Lego and you come and lock the lemon on the team. Ah. Hey, yo. Hmm. Lem. I need a lem. T T D. Enter. Eh. I need a tin pacho. You're a key queen, right? A tin pacho. Boy. Bad it was, Tony. Yeah. So, Niki coming out, Tony, Otoa, when you were lep tesu, lep. You're a key queen, right? No, you know. Let me put it this way. Mm. My father, retired Colonel Tony Otoa. Oh. I come from the family of retired Colonel Tony Otoa. I am one of the sons. You know, when people hear my name, mm. Tony Otoa, they sometimes think the old man is still working. <laughs> and I say, no, the old man has retired. Now I'm the one who's working. Yeah, that is working. I'm the one who's working. But I come from uh, Lira. Okay. I come from a village called Agwen. And uh, the village or the village itself where I really, really come from is called Baruganda. So when you go to Lira and you look for anyone called Otowa Tony, you will, they will tell you follow the road through Ngeta. When you get to a grand <laughs> trading center, ask anyone. Mm. They will tell you a junior, you know they call me junior. When you go ah. looking for Tony Otowa, they won't know Tony Otowa. They only know Junior Otowa. So your father was also Tony Yes, Otoa. he is Tony You inherited Otoa. both his names. All of the names. That's why it, it confuses very many people. Ah, yes, okay. Yes. Wow, Tony, you are an exceptional man. You're doing a great job for Apoya. people that do not know you. Thank you. Your executive director at Stand Big, a business incubator, yes. which is helping so many SMEs, uh, yes. small and medium enterprises, get opportunities yes. in the oil and gas space. Something that we do not know much about it. You're yes. going to tell us more of what you're doing here. Right. But before we get there, we want to get to know more about you. Mm. Like mm. you told us, you're from Lira. So you're one of us. Yeah, of, of course. You're our I, son. I, 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 that's why I said a teen party. I'm a teen party. <laughs> yeah, homeboy. I'm a homeboy. So in your words, who is Tony? Uh, Tony Otoa is a 40-year-old a hustler. Still like young. Yeah, very young. Mm. Don't, don't think of the gray hair. <laughs> the, the gray, gray hair, hair can you be You know, they usually say, I, I, went and, I went to the bathroom and I forgot <laughs> to wash my hair well. So that could be the problem. And so I am Tony Otoa. I am one of the sons of a uh, retired colonel, like I mentioned before. I grew up, well, I was born here in Kampala. And then, of course, that time my father was in the military. So we grew up in Bugolobi Flats. Oh. Bugolobi Flats at the time was military area, you know. So that's mm. where I grew up from. I was raised uh, both in Kampala, then my father got transferred to Jinja. And when he gets transferred to Jinja, he was working in the, mag in the barracks called Maga Maga, yeah, which was the armory of, uh, at, at the time. And while there, of course, we had the coup that happened in 1985-86, and we had to have issues where we, you know, some of us were running into exile and so on and so forth. And then, we returned, and when we returned in 1987, my mother, we returned first of all with my mother. We were in a small room like this office. Six kids and our mother on a mattress. One mattress. Why the sudden shift? It was such a sudden shift which was a reality of life in the sense that from the high life we were living, we had nothing at the end of the day that we ended up living with nothing 
our father gone at the time and coming back to the reality of life of single room, single room situation. So my mother was the teacher, the doctor, the nurse, the everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was a humbling experience. But what that taught us or what that also made us realize. How many siblings are you? So we are seven in total. And uh, in that area, in that hierarchy, I'm like number three. So I am somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. and we're about uh, seven of us. And yeah, so we came back, lived in Jinja, started school again in Jinja, grew up in Jinja, moved to Musoka College Miri for my uh, A-level, oh, sorry, O-levels. But before I did that, I went to Namasagali, I was expelled. Yeah. Who, who, I was a, that, now, this is where the hustler story comes in, because I, I, I liked to do business. Uh, let me first take you back shortly. Yes. So, the schools that you went to, Namasagali, yes. was among. Yes. Who gets expelled from Namasagali? I know, people always ask that. But you see, when you are not interested in music, drama, and you're more interested in escaping from school to go and buy things and come and sell at a good price, that is where the issue comes about. So I was expelled and then I was taken to a very serious Catholic school in Jinja called Lakeview. The school again took me back to the basics of humility. It because you were starting to be rebellious. It was a one block school. We had to bring our desks. We had to... It was a village school. But I think for me, it was the way that my father could show me that uh, he's in control. Mm -hmm. So um, I got through the school and then of course went to Pusoka College really for my A-levels where I decided to to survive and uh, really do the best I could, although I was expelled again <laughs> towards. <laughs> you must <laughs> have been such a rebel growing up. Expelled towards the towards the end uh, during examination time, but I was called back to do my exams, and we were striking because of a school bus which we had been paying for and had not come. So we had somehow a right to do what we were doing. <laughs> I wouldn't want my children to go through that experience, but uh, of course I wouldn't understand it now. So I left that and then uh, decided to um, become a tanboy immediately after I finished uh, school. Wow. Now, like uh, I told you, I just entrepreneurship for me was something that I really enjoyed. Yeah. I became a tanboy and I used to be a tanboy for a fuso truck. You know, a fuso truck, <laughs> a real truck, fuso. We used to take dry fish from Masese in Jinja to Mbale. Then from Bali we continue to Kumi or Severe, get dry cassava. So, so where was this inspiration coming from? Uh, coming from, a, uh, for lack of a better word, a middle income family, you had the money. For you to become a tan boy, yeah. did you feel inconvenienced or something? No, I think partly it was also the desire to travel. The desire to travel and see other places. And I think that was the best way that could happen for me. We would travel all the way, pick up cassava and all of the things, and come back to Kazimingi in Jinja. My father was not happy. Most of my peers had now gone to university. I was still with my hustle. My father not being happy with me, so I decided to look out for jobs that I really enjoyed. And that's how I became a journalist. So how I became a journalist, I used to move around Kampala with a small tape recorder, looking for stories. Uh, Tony, you're taking me very, very fast. <laughs> I want to get to know <laughs> yeah. the real uh, Tony. Uh, in from that life of having a father living in Bogolovic yeah. and then going to yeah. you know, uh, I want you to tell me one of your fondest memories that helped lay that foundation of a hustler as a child. Well, I think for me it was the strong desire to 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 to, to be self independent. I moved away from home at a very young age. I moved away from home. I think immediately after senior five. So senior six, pretty much uh, on a hustle, hustle, senior six vacation, I left home. So the desire to, to do something, to survive, to, to stand out was very evident at the time. And I think partly for me that's where that entrepreneurial desire comes, but also the risk taking comes, where so many risks come into play. And you know, you really want to do something to try and do, you know, be a better person, do something for yourself. So that explains why I now try to become a journalist. Walking around Kampala looking for a story. When I see people fighting, I record, and I say, oh, there's no story. Then this one day, you know, this one day was a very good day. They always say news, a bad day or a bad news is, or bad news is good news, right? 
Saturday, I heard that UBC has a match. They are marching from City Square to Uganda House. Who is the person in charge of the marching session? Agri Award. I said, ah, this is a good story. We go to Uganda, we go to City Square. We organize. We start marching in Uganda House. Hey, 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 hey mama. <laughs> now when we reach Uganda House, Chiboko and bullets started flying out. And that is when a journalism student called Jimmy Higeni was killed or murdered. If you remember, he was shot. So I ran to Monitor. Monitor at that time was at, uh, uh, it was called um, Crown House. Crown House. Below there was Baker's World, and it was up. Mm -hmm. There was a lady called Rachel Mugarura who was very tough. Never, you know, hey, you know. Anyway, I just said, play this clip. It is worth one. So she listens to it. She says, hey, are these the bullets I was hearing? She writes the story quickly, runs it on the news as a breaking story. So we break the story. And she says, okay, you small skinny boy. I used to be very, very small. Forget about this right now. <laughs> this is because I'm eating a little bit of bueno here and there. But I was very small then. <laughs> So, she asked me to come back on Monday to become a freelance journalist. Tony, um, from becoming a tan boy, from yeah. being a tan boy, yeah. to now uh, finding yourself in journalism, mm. that shift, it's, it's so difficult for someone who is in the transport sector, a tan boy, to dream so big yeah. that, oh, today I want to be. And journalism is a passion. Yeah. I'm told people are born. Where yeah. did yours come from? So, 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 so in school, I was always part of like uh, a, a writing club. I was always part of a, a debate society and all of that. So I enjoyed these things. That time, there used to be Andrew Mender live at 7 o'clock. And we used to call in. It was very free, by the way. You just dial 933 and it goes through. And that really ignited that passion for journalism. So even on that track, you would always believe that there's always that uh, conversation around journalism that will pop up. So I think that for me explains how I connect to the journalism part. So I come up on a Monday, my first day of work. I had never used a computer in my life. <laughs> so when they say write the story properly for filing, <laughs> <laughs> you know how you press Q, then you look for Z, <laughs> then you look for T, then you look, you don't know how to go down, you can say hello, okay, can be first to enter. Uh, so, it was a, an interesting point, but I learned so fast in less than a year to become a, a, the chief parliamentary reporter, yeah, for uh, the radio station at the time, and I used also to write for the, new, the newspaper. I covered the war in Congo uh, during the time when Uganda was present in Congo. Now we are back. I covered yes, the time when we were there. Uh, I covered the Drodro massacres. I covered the U U UNRF2 peace talks and, 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 and ceasefire in uh, Yumbe. I became passionate about reporting and journalism. Now, while I'm doing that, the station was becoming a news talk radio. Sorry, changing from a news talk radio to a normal radio station to deal with competition. So you're a bona fide journalist at this point? Yeah, uh, well, street journalist because mine was kangaroo. I had to learn the hard <laughs> way, you know, mm. uh, how to write a story, how to, you know. So you taught books, yourself? How to teach myself. But I rose the ranks so fast. It was quite interesting because I became the youngest ever Secretary General of the Uganda Parliamentary Press Association. That's big. Yeah. Samuju was under me, man. I was his boss. Samuju uh, Nganda? Yes. He was a reporter for the New Vision at the time. Wow. Yeah. So uh, those were very interesting times because it just showed that anything is possible if you just really put your mind to it and if you really want to achieve it. It's just about having that vision and clarity of the vision and it just pursuing you. Mm. So anyway, the radio station is now changing into a, new, uh, a, a, a music station as well. So I got co-opted by a gentleman called Timothy Kalejira and Andrew Mwenda to be the first DJ on Friday nights and Saturday nights. Had you been a DJ before? No. I had to learn on the job. So that time we had CDs and mini discs where you put it in, you wait for the song, you look for another song. We used to move in albums of CDs. You know, you enter a studio with your whole album of CDs and play music. It was quite interesting and a good learning journey. And my studio name 
was Black Daddy Sugar Love. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> so, you know, when you, when you when I was, a, like I said, I was a skinny boy. I was small, I was tiny. The only way to get attention on radio where people are not seeing you, you have to sound big. Or look good and big. <laughs> and that is where that came from. Black so, Jack. Black Daddy. Black sugar Daddy love. Sugar Love. BDSL. That's so long. <laughs> <laughs> I've given it a abbreviation BDSL. Uh huh. So it's around the time that, uh, <clears throat> you know, many young people at that time my peers especially who else at university i hadn't gone to university i around that time i had gone to Macquarie for one semester and i dropped out i wasn't interested what I course were you doing political science it didn't interest you mm, no man i mean dr simba coming and talked about Machiavelli, professor michelle is talking about all these things it wasn't my thing at that time a lot of young people were talking about going for chair you know people would go for chair come back after two months looking good Latest phone, latest shoe. Ah. So I didn't want to go to you. But I said I have also to go and get latest shoe, latest shirt, latest phone. <laughs> so I decided to go to the UK. So you abandoned the radio and the journalism that you were doing. I'll tell you how I abandoned it, which is so funny. I decided to go to the UK, and this one day I just go to the British High Commission. It was here at Parliament Avenue. I ask for visa papers and applications and they give it to me. I go to my father and I say, you know what, I was hey, I mean, UK. UK. Huh? You know, if I go to UK, your life is sorted. Jose <laughs> Otoa <laughs> laughed. He said, look at this young man. Look at this young man. Mama Jimmy, okay, be listen to this young man here. He said, you go, go, you refuse to go to school and you want to go away. So anyway, I said, okay, that's fine. I had to wait for the end of the month to get some money and organize my papers and everything and I went for my visa interview. That time it was for lining up at the parliamentary avenue. It was for lining up and they only take 120 people. I arrived very early at 9 p.m. for my interview. The interview the next day, right? <laughs> but I arrived at 9 p.m. because I night. had to be at the front of the queue. I came with my uncle Trevor. We are there with my uncle Trevor. I said, okay, let me go and sleep. I'll come back at three. Because our studio was very close by, Monitor Studios. Yeah. So you were working Uncle in the Trevor night. was number three, I think, in the line. <laughs> Uncle Trevor sold my places. And by the time I came back at three, I was, I think, a hundred and something at the end. Because, you know, when you sell someone in front, you also sell to another person. Mm. But anyway, we are there. We are in a group of people uh, learning all of these things. When they ask you that, that thing, the big clock, you said, Big Ben. Hey, okay, Big Ben. Ah, I win you, I win you. Mm -hmm. When they ask you about the big, the thing that turns, London Eye. Oh, I win you, London Eye. Okay, okay, okay. The morning of Mzubu comes, counts us and puts us in. I am a pick number 113 or something. So at this point, what are you telling? What is in your mind? What am I going to do in the UK? I, I am have... going as a tourist, but I'm going for change. I'm going to hustle. My idea was, I think it would be a quicker way of making some good money as well. You know, and starting up myself, really starting up myself. I go in, I had just learned the word apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so now, this is one o'clock. Everyone, even the guys who were training us, have lost, they haven't gotten visas, they're coming out. Oh, my time comes. I've just learned the word apparently. Well, hello, mate, how are you? I said, I'm okay. So, where are you going? I said, apparently, I'm going to the UK. <laughs> You're intimidating the white man. <laughs> okay. So who's paying for your trip? Apparently, man. They said, yeah, young man, let's come back tomorrow for your visa. <laughs> He's tired. I am tired. We are exhausted. <laughs> he just said, come back. <laughs> now, Uncle Trevor, after selling those sports, had got him some money. We went to a place called TLC that night. I bought drinks for people I don't even know to celebrate our visa. Came back the next day, picked up the visa, went back to Buse, I said, Buse, now done the heavy lifting. So wait, the white man actually gave you the visa. Yeah. He was convinced that apparently you are going apparently. to <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> so I go to my old man and I say, you know, I think it's time for me to go. I need you to support me with my ticket. 
Muse he says look at this man you you still have it and understood that you have refused to go to school and uh, so I had to it was a 6 month visa I had to look for money I had my small house in Namwongo very like a small room in Namwongo I had to sell my TV my already a lot of these things to uh, pay for my tickets but of course it wasn't enough money it was money for looking for money and you know when you're looking for money you stop somewhere you drink an ale special to think about a strategy <laughs> and who to go which uncle do you have who has money it was interesting that i finally got myself to get out of the country when my visa was almost running out wow yeah So I went in. I went to my auntie Helen Oula, very nice lady, my father's sister. Mm. Stayed with her in London. Began my first job at a car wash. I was in a place in in a place that has very very many amazing low people in Stratford. So that's where I began my washing of cars behind the Sainsburys. Uh, it's only uh, listening to your story sorry yeah. to cut in to your story you a person who does not look down at any job no. something which is not very common with us from the north yeah. we don't do a lot of these jobs so, so what so is it about you I, i always believe that every opportunity is an opportunity for you to be great it doesn't matter what it is if it's sweeping at least you sweep great you know martin luther king has this very interesting saying where he says um um if you're not if you're not the sun be a star i think that's what it says if you're not even sun be a star if you're not a road be a path if you're not a tree be a fig you know if you're not a uh, 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 the grass if, if if you're cleaner do it just 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 be able to stand out and do it the best way you can because it's through that that you actually get opportunity and you actually elevate yourself because then nothing seems inexplicable Now I'm very stoic and I think you can see my office you'll see Marcus Aurelius everywhere. Yeah. Stoicism is very much about being grounded. Everything you see here which is nice even my jacket it's nothing because at the end of the day we always say I am a spirit moving in the corpse. Yeah. So nothing goes with you. So the reality of life is that whatever you look down upon could actually be your best way of shining. So I began with the car wash thing then after that I decided the cold was too much. In your way you wash a car and your fingers become stuck and then they say you put in the hot water and it will it was crazy. Crazy. So I finished that. After about 3 weeks I decided no, I have to get a job in a kitchen or a closed environment. So that is when I got a job at TGI Fridays. Why the kitchen of all? It was warm, it was nice, but it was also so many Ugandans were working there. So they had an opportunity for me to get it. So that's where I worked for some time uh, on the grill. And if you see my social media it has a lot of roasting <laughs> or when you hear my brother Robert Kaushega talk about <laughs> me or introducing me he talks about meat. But I I was a grillsman for over 6 years. Wow. In that kitchen. That's I started long. off as a dishwasher guy and graduated all the way to the grill. Wow. So that was that was my journey before I decided to go to school. Now So for 6 years you were only working yeah, without was, going to school. Yeah. Working, saving. That's the time when my mother fell sick. She had cancer. Wow. And a lot of my money was now being spent on her treatment. Ha, ah, she passes on uh, around 2006 and that for me was just, you know, the breaking point where I'm like, okay, wait. Um I am doing this jail. I am not in school. I am and that time there was this thing called Hi-Fi. The social media platform called Hi-Fi yeah, hi. and MySpace. Mm, MySpace of hi. And I used to see my friends who I was in school with already driving and I'm saying, "Hey, I am here in the still kitchen, hustling in the kitchen. Our shifts, you get in at 7, you leave at midnight. 7 a.m." Oh, so it was crazy. But uh, we managed. So <laughs> If I tell you there was this Ugandan guy who told me I leave your auntie's house you know you need to be independent and a big boy my auntie said ah you listen to you Ugandans I said no me I'm tired I want to be on my own So for 6 years your auntie housed you Started for about a year a year and then I moved out for the rest of the time okay. And when I moved out for the rest of the time I <laughs> this Ugandan guy you know he, <laughs> he told me he had a room for me 
but the room was so small you could not fit a mattress. So I had to go and buy a pressure bed, those pressure beds mm. with a foot pump. Mm. Now, at 3 a.m., the pressure is out, so you have to wake up <laughs> <laughs> and pump. With a... And yet you have to sleep to wake up early. You know, it taught me something about life. You know, the UK can be very cold. So I had a small fan, which had a coil and a fan, yeah? Now, when you put it on for one minute, it can roast you. So you switch it off. When you switch it off, after 30 seconds, it's, it's too cold. cold. No regular. Ah. Anyway, so when my mother passes on, I decide, I think it's time for me to go back to school. So that's when I start applying for universities. Uh, applied to go to Middlesex University, uh, Oxford Brookes University, Nottingham University, Notting Nottingham University, yes, and some others. Then I got accepted to three of them. But I opted to go for the Oxford Brookes. Which is uh, your, your mother's uh, passing was a blessing in this case. Yeah, it, they always say there are those moments that really turn you around. Yeah. You know, usually when they say um, someone is probably addicted to something yeah. and there's going to be a turning point for him or someone is wasting away their life and yeah. there's going to be a turning point, you shouldn't, you know, over prescribe what should be in their life. Mm. That was my turning point. And I came back. How I got a student's visa, thank God. I got a student's visa and I went back. This time, Wait, you came back to Uganda? Yes, I had to come back to get my student's visa. Because your visa had expired. Way, Way back. Mm. So I had to come back and get a student's visa. And that's how I got back into university. So I did my first degree in uh, international law. and. and, and, and so there's, there's, there's something about you, either luck or something. Because yeah. after spending six years in the UK and then yeah. you come back and again, again mm. get a student visa, that doesn't happen. Often. Yeah, so for me, I, I really wouldn't actually put it down to luck. For me, it's just like saying, test and see. You know, don't just sit back and say, ah, this won't happen. T push the boundaries, test and see. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, you know, it's okay. Mm -hmm. So I came back, uh, got it, went back, studied uh, international relations and law. I, I had to work three jobs to pay for my tuition and my upkeep. Now my father had retired, no longer in the army. I had to work, this is how I used to work. So I would wake up in the morning at 9, be at school by 9, university by 9, and by 2, 2.30, we are getting done and I'm heading to Ladbrox, which was a betting company, and that's where I would work until about 8.39. And then at 9, I would go to a kitchen in a place called Headington, to do last minute orders and cleaning up the kitchen. The grilling plus the cleaning. Yeah, up to midnight. Then at midnight, I would go to the post office with so sorting out letters until 4 a.m. No way. Yeah, then 4 a.m., go sleep for three years. Seven days a week. For three years. Three years. What? That's so that's how I managed to pay for my tuition. That's right? hustling. Yeah. I managed to pay for my tuition that way, managed to get my degree. And when I was going to graduate a week before, I decided I had to fly my father to witness what he has been pushing me to do because he was, oh, that time British Airways was still flying. I flew him business class. Derek. You can ask him. Whoa. You had made. I, I flew him to my university for my graduation. That must I think for him it was a good thing moment of pride for him yeah yeah like you know then after that again i became restless i was like oh what do we do now <laughs> okay we've got a degree but it's not what i really want so what do we do so that's how i moved to qatar hustle hustle you left after the qatar. uk to qatar yeah, hustle, so what's hustle. driving you all this time what are you looking for for myself i'm looking for fulfillment fulfillment of myself so it's not so it's moving beyond settling so I was, I was, I was, I was, I, if you ask me really sincerely, and I answered you sincerely, I was restless still. I was trying to find myself. So I leave Qatar, come back for my master's in the same university. I did my master's in international law. And at that time, I wanted to be a big boy. I wanted to be at the ICC, you know? My, my, my plan was to work at the ICC. Um, towards the As end a of lawyer. The degree, yeah, towards the end of my master's, I realized uh, I don't think this is a thing for me. I now get involved in oil and gas. While still in England? 
I get so involved in it. So me and a guy called Angelo Izama start writing stuff together, writing publications together, doing stuff, investigating here and there. Da, 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 da. Then I get a job with Oxfam at the headquarters in uh, the UK. The, the headquarters at that time were in uh, Oxford itself. I get posted to Ghana. I'm like, ah, uh, uh, I'm me. going home. <laughs> you, um, you're a man of all, I don't know, jack of all trades. You've yeah. done everything from a turn boy, yeah. a journalist, lawyer. Yeah. Now you're in oil and gas. Something that most, not many people do. Career shifts. Like, what's, what's pushing you at this moment? So, for me, I think it was the ability to have foresight. And this is where I really appreciate people like Angelo Izama. I think you know Angelo Izama. Yeah, He's do, a very amazing guy. He, even my career path. I always consult with him, by the way, before any of these. <laughs> He's that one guy who I, he was my best man, by the way, at my wedding. Ah, That's how close, close you are. He has been that beacon, you know, like, like that guy who says, this is okay, this is not. And that time, we had this thing that the oil and gas was going to be the future. We had just discovered, oh, it was a big deal here, but there was not much Ugandan participation. So we just had a feeling. So we just said, okay, where can we maximize our potential? We are not drillers, we are not engineers, we are not... How about we start working on policy issues? When was that? Around issues? which year? 2009. 2009, okay. 2010. And then 2011, at the beginning, I decided, should I come back, should I not? But I finally came back in 2012 and settled. Your story. I yeah. want us to go for a break, then you <laughs> okay. come back and you hear your return to Uganda. Okay. Atie kan kitoni okao otoa. Atieno wa me pa jama ya akilera ma le moro wa pete akotoa. Le ba chole wa le plo wa pete akotoa. Watika dumo le moro mangi ni wano tika wenye tika tiri yado akiri kwaone. Kira eneti uke dar ma diet is stand big business incubator kan. Ena legi ni kongwa chair yuema na kado wadugi. Thank you.